The Halo franchise has had its ups and downs since Bungie left the property roughly 10 years ago. Even though Halo was once the first person shooter franchise that defined the Xbox and led its developer Bungie into stardom, the series' recent handling by the developers at 343 Industries has been inconsistent. For a few examples, 2012's Halo 4 had a good campaign, but its multiplayer took too many elements from Call of Duty. 2015's Halo 5 Guardians had good multiplayer, but its campaign was the the worst of the series, and the development of the new title Halo Infinite was rocky with many delays and a fair few high-profile people jumping ship mid-development, much like how Master Chief often scurries away from a Covenant cruiser that's about to explode, because maybe Chief should just close the lid before flushing next time. Indeed, Halo Infinite had a lot to prove, both for the people working on it and for fans of the franchise that want to see Halo still be among the upper echelon of first-party Xbox titles and science fiction first-person shooters. There was a a lot riding on this game, and thankfully 343 Industries has succeeded with Halo Infinite for the most part. In fact, Halo Infinite's campaign is quite good. It's a breath of fresh air combining the franchise's linear story-based levels and rock-paper-scissors combat with a beautiful open world that can be traversed on foot, in vehicle, or grapple hook Spider-Man style in order to overtake enemy command posts, find secrets, and uncover new gear so that you can unlock new abilities in order to take the fight to the enemy, and it is quite a damn good Halo campaign all around. It's pretty damn fun, to be honest. The multiplayer is solid as well, though it does have its problems. Lots of problems. But for the sake of simplicity, this video is just going to be a review of Halo Infinite's single-player campaign, starting with its story. The plot follows none other than the iconic Super Soldier Master Chief, who was floating around in space for an undetermined amount of time, that lazy fuck, after the UNSC Infinity Space Cruiser stationed around Zeta Halo was decimated in an attack by the Banished, who are a brute-led army of former Covenant aliens who intend to fire the super weapon that is Zeta Halo, which is something that would destroy all life in the universe because that's a halo. Death is what it does. Eventually, Master Chief is awoken from his slumber by Pelican pilot Fernando Esparza and learns that the Banished have near total control of Zeta Halo, but still don't have the ability to activate the ring. And from there, Master Chief, a reluctant Fernando, and the AI named Weapon, who is an infiltration AI originally meant to mimic and defeat the evil AI Cortana, all take the fight to the Banished on Zeta Halo, trying to reclaim every inch of ground lost to the Banished, help UNSC survivors, and mount a counterattack against the banished before this nefarious foe fires the ring, good luck. The story overall is quite good, mostly because the characterizations, for the most part, are on point. The character dynamic between the stoic mission-focused Master Chief and the personality-laden weapon is wonderful, the brute war chief Eshurim and his scenery-chewing deep growly voice make for a good antagonist, there was a moment where I got teary-eyed towards the end of the game, yes really, I cried during a Halo game, deal with it, and the narrative swings really complement the gameplay, adding a sense of thrill and desperation to the combat as the plot unfolds. It is all around an awesome story-driven campaign. This is surprising considering that the story of the previous game, Halo 5 Guardians, was such a disaster. While the campaign of Halo 5 Guardians had some good controls and some solid missions, its story was a complete clusterfuck. Most of the game didn't take place from the Master Chief's perspective, instead focusing on the far less interesting Spartan Locke, and the game's evil Cortana plotline was pure cringe. And honestly, many people, including myself, hated it, which only makes sense. After all, we, the player, had spent the whole series loving the Chief and Cortana dynamic, hell, 343's Halo 4 got this dynamic very right, but Halo 5 Guardians threw all of that decade and a half's worth of characterization and emotional investment in these characters out the window into the Applebee's dumpster in favor of Cortana being evil, and that just sucked from both a fan perspective and a storytelling perspective, because many of us loved these characters and their respective dynamic, mostly because it's a dynamic that gave the otherwise cold and emotionless Master Chief a heart and a personality beyond beyond just being a killing machine. And due to Halo 5's missteps, the Halo Infinite writing team had to make some tough choices in regards to following up the shit show known as Halo 5 Guardians Up and figure out how to bring the heart back into Halo. But ultimately, the writing team made the correct decision by essentially abandoning the evil Cortana plotline, because truly, Halo Infinite is a soft reboot. While the evil Cortana saga still exists in the mythos, you mostly only learn of the conclusion to that storyline through good characters like Weapon, 
or through audio logs which add to Halo Infinite's extensive lore, and the game instead focuses on a new and more narratively interesting conflict with the Banished, all while rekindling that lovely Chief and Cortana dynamic, though this time it's Chief and Weapon, to an absolutely wonderful and sometimes wholesome effect, because Weapon is just such a wonderful personality, I love her, and thankfully Halo Infinite's narrative is all the better for it. It is quite good. Halo Infinite's gameplay is stellar as well, though on the surface it appears similar to the Halo formula. After all, Master Chief still has his trademark regenerating health, the ability to only hold on to two weapons at a time, the ability to drive almost any vehicle in the game, and he still fights Covenant adjacent and sentinel enemies which have a very satisfying rock paper scissors type of combat that requires the player to change up their arsenal and strategy depending on the situation. Grenades against jackals, plasma against shields, bullets against flesh, and etc. It is and always has been a lot of fun. But with that being said, there is a big difference to the combat, mostly in the form of the armor abilities. In past Halo games like Halo 3, Halo Reach, and Halo 4, armor abilities were equipment that you picked up and used and varied on a scale of usefulness, mostly because they were often balanced for the sake of multiplayer to the detriment of the single player campaign, see Halo 4. But Halo Infinite is different. Once you find new armor abilities, they stick with you throughout the campaign and can be equipped and unequipped. Abilities ranging from the grapple hook, the drop wall or shield, motion detector, and a dash ability that can all be upgraded at a rewarding pace. And truly, rewarding is the correct word here. Seeing as Halo Infinite's runtime is longer than any other Halo game before due to its open world, the armor abilities add a refreshing element to the series' staple combat. Alongside the great variety of enemy types and new and returning weapons and vehicles, it is fun to use these abilities on the fly in combat. Whether you are shooting a motion tracker that detects invisible enemies, grappling a different weapon when you run out of ammo, dropping a shield in front of you so that you can fire your weapon in the open without leaving yourself vulnerable to enemies, or dashing away from the attack of a hunter, the game is a blast and consistently introduces new combat encounters, abilities, and upgrades, even if those said upgrades are fairly rudimentary, that keep you invested in the game. It keeps the gameplay loop invigorating. However, Halo Infinite offers more to the player than just refined combat. In fact, the game is the franchise's first venture into the open world genre. Set on a decently sized map, Halo Infinite's Zeta Halo locale is packed with command points to capture, banished bases to obliterate, high profile targets to assassinate, marines to assist, and upgrade points to obtain, which is pretty new and cool to a Halo game. There is a lot to do. Admittedly, this opens up Halo Infinite to a long-running criticism about the ubiquity of shopping list style open world AAA games. After all, the AAA industry is littered with these types of games, much like how a movie theater is littered with popcorn after showing a Marvel movie on opening night. And admittedly, Halo Infinite is yet another game in this category. But with that being said, we honestly have not seen an open world set in the Halo franchise before. A sizable Halo map, though one that isn't all that big in the grand scheme of things, with objectives for the player to tackle at their leisure, is new ground for the franchise. Sure, on paper it is yet another open world game, but honestly, we have not seen an open world game exactly like this before. An open world game with Halo's unique combat, colorful science fiction visual art style, creative vehicles and weapons, and deep lore. And truly compared to an Ubisoft Assassin's Creed game or Far Cry, Halo Infinite just feels fresh, just like Nathan Drake. Additionally, the open world really complements the Halo series' thematic presence. In the early Halo games, seeing the ring world and its environments for the first time was awe-inspiring. We saw a world that was simultaneously beautiful, yet one with hauntingly dark secrets and mysteries, and Halo Infinite captures this feeling as well. The map of Zeta Halo is sizable, though not too big as to be overwhelming, and it features lots of unique architecture and photo-frame-worthy environments. It is stunning to look at. Furthermore, the open world really befits a Master Chief-focused narrative. As a character, Master Chief is a super soldier who can and has changed the tides of various battles and even wars just by being involved, and the conflict on Zeta Halo is no exception. Despite how the odds are stacked against him, like they always are, Master Chief takes the fight to the banished. Through every enemy defeated, every base vanquished, and every marine saved, we the player feel as if we are the Master Chief, and that we are making a difference by liberating this world from enemy hands. We feel like we are the heroes in this narrative, and we feel like we embody the Master Chief. Just like how Cortana probably embodies his armor in vibrate mode. The open world's 
customizable elements are a lot of fun as well. See, when Master Chief does a good deed, he earns valor points, which allows him to utilize Fernando's Pelican to airdrop items at one of the human-occupied outposts dubbed the Forward Operating Bases, or FOBs. At a FOB, the player can choose what weapons they want to use on a specific mission, or if they want a specific vehicle like a Warthog or a Mongoose. And as the game goes on, Master Chief unlocks more and more items. Items like specialty weapons, or even scorpion tanks, or flight-worthy vehicles like Hornets that the player can use to decimate their enemies. And due to all these options, Halo Infinite's campaign remains a fun ride throughout. It is an overwhelmingly enjoyable experience. With all that being said, though, Halo Infinite's campaign does have a fair few problems. For one thing, the open-world aspects of the game can get a bit repetitive at times. After all, the more linear story-based missions are often more focused and intense as far as action set pieces go. In these missions, there's usually more going on in them. In fact, the story really motivates the action the player engages in, and the combat has a surviving by the skin of my teeth feel as Master Chief swaps out various weapons and uses different abilities in order to come out on top, which is fairly different from the more open world combat, which is far more controlled and contained due to how the player can stock up on the weapons and vehicles they want when at a fob. And honestly, some of the side quests like the rescue the marines ones or the assassinate high profile target missions can get a bit samey due to this, though the stronghold missions are overall pretty great throughout. And sure, the customization in regards to the open world missions is fun and has its place, but a lot of the open world combat settles for being pretty good, whereas the linear story based missions are great and are hectic and make you feel like you are barely hanging on by the seat of your pants. The story missions are comparatively more intense. Admittedly, Halo Infinite's pacing does not help matters. See, in most open world games, story missions are interspersed in the open world seamlessly. Like in a game like Grand Theft Auto, you do one 15 minute to half hour mission, then you go back into the open world and do what you want. You have the option of continuing the story or just doing whatever you'd like. In some cases, you can even go bowling. But Halo Infinite missteps here. In fact, many of the main story missions are stacked on top of each other and can't be exited until completed. Missions that combine can take hours, and due to this, the open world and the story-driven missions don't always feel synchronized, because whenever I decided to do a story mission, I didn't know how long it would take to complete it and how far into the game these missions would progress me, which unfortunately made me wary to start story missions when I still had open world objectives on my checklist and upgrades to obtain. And this caused a snowball effect, because over time, the open world gameplay, while good on its own merits, can get repetitive when there isn't a strong story mission to spice up the proceedings. While once again the stronghold missions are still pretty awesome throughout, there is only so many times where you can rescue marines or assassinate a target before it starts to blur together at times. And even though I still had fun in these instances, my experience with Halo Infinite got a little flat in these instances whenever my play session extended longer. Some of the map traversal elements could have been better as well. When driving a war Warthog, mongoose, or ghost towards an objective marker, there isn't a GPS or a path of arrows that tells you if you're going in the best possible route. In fact, often the opposite is the case. On my way to an objective, I often found myself driving into the path of a mountain and thusly abandoned my vehicle in favor of going on foot and using my grapple hook, which is a problem because vehicles are useful, especially when taking on high profile banished targets or their bases. Yet, a fair amount of the time, I often found myself just abandoning my warthog because I couldn't figure out the best possible route that didn't involve me grappling up a mountain like Batman. It is a problem. Even though standing atop a mountain and shouting, I am the knight, is fun, not gonna lie. The narrative has some problems as well, mostly in the form of Fernando, who is pretty damn annoying. While the heart and best part of the game's story is the characterization between Master Chief and Weapon, the game also tries to forge a connection between the action-ready Chief and the just-want-to-go-home-to-see-his-family Fernando. But sadly, this character dynamic doesn't work mainly due to how Fernando is kind of annoying. While Fernando does play an important part in the narrative, the lengths in which Master Chief goes to protect him and to quote-unquote not fail him fall flat because, as I said, he is irritating. All he does is complain about everything. With every new narrative development, the dude bemoans the fact that he can't just go home and see his family. He whines, and even though it is understandable for someone in his predicament to miss his loved ones, it pales in comparison to the fact that the universe will end if he and Master Chief don't prevent the Banish from firing the ring. There would be no family for Fernando to get back to, because they'd be 
dead. God, I really don't like this character. The lack of co-op at launch is another problem. Even though campaign co-op had always been a staple of the Halo franchise and helped Halo be the definitive Nintendo-style party game on Xbox, split screen and co-op was absent from Halo Infinite at launch and won't be added until at least May of 2022, meaning that a core franchisal part of the game is unavailable until at least six months after launch, which stinks worse than a wet dog turd on a white bedsheet. Hell, even Halo 5 Guardians, you know, the worst Halo game, at least had online co-op, and while sure Halo Infinite's single player is much meatier compared to any other Halo game before it due to its scale, open world, and RPG mechanics, hell, it had to be stacked with meaningful content in order to justify its own sales separate from its free-to-play multiplayer, it is still disheartening because for a franchise that's renowned for bringing people together to play a co-op campaign, it is disappointing that this essential game mode wasn't available and ready to go at release. Least. It was saddening. Last but not least, Halo Infinite suffers from some technical issues. Throughout my experience with the campaign, my game crashed roughly three times, which admittedly is in no way a deal breaker or an egregious amount of crashes, see Cyberpunk 2077 at launch, but it is still worth noting because, well, performance issues are important to note in a review, so this is me pointing that out. Okay, so admittedly, Halo Infinite's campaign does have a fair few issues. Some of the open world elements can get repetitive, the pacing and the synchronicity of the open world and the story-based sections aren't always one-to-one, -one. some of the level traversal could have benefited from some ideas that are present from other open world games, I don't like Fernando Esparza as a character, the game was missing co-op at launch, and my game crashed a few times, and wow, that's a lot of problems. But with that being said, it is worth noting that this is 343 Industries' first attempt at creating an open world Halo game with soft RPG elements, and most of the rough aspects of the game spawn from the fact that this is their first time making a campaign on this scale, meaning that some growing pains are necessary for them to improve in the future. Sure, these problems are still problems, obviously, but many of them are forgivable in the grand scheme of things. Furthermore, it is also worth pointing out that the good parts of Halo Infinite are still really good. The narrative is overall engaging, the character dynamic between Chief and Weapon reflects the past great dynamic between Chief and Cortana, the banished are cool bad guys, the combat is still unique to Halo, the upgradable armor abilities add a certain nuance to the action, the open world elements, while rough in a few places, breathe new life into the series, and best of all, Halo Infinite looks and feels like a Halo game at its core, and truly, even with its myriad of problems, I can't recommend Halo Infinite enough. It is a blast, and fully embodies Halo's franchisal spirit. See ya. And with that, that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like rating, share, subscribe, ring the bell, and leave a comment telling me what you think of Halo Infinite's campaign. Also, please consider checking out my Patreon page. $1 a month gets you onto this nifty credit sequence and onto my Discord server, and $5 a month or more gives you access to review requests. Get on that. And speaking of Patreon, I just want to thank my patrons, especially my high tier patrons in David, Samantha, Devlin, Mom, and Morgan. Thank you so much for supporting what I do. Love y'all. I am the knight!